Symbols and Signs by Vladimir Novikov, narrated by John Wilkins. For the fourth time in as many years, they were confronted with the problem of what birthday present to take a young man who was incurably deranged in his mind. Desires he had none. Man-made objects were to him either hives or evil, vibrant with malignant activity that he alone could perceive, or gross comforts for which no use could be found in his abstract world. After eliminating a number of articles that might offend him or frighten him, anything in the gadget line, for instance, was taboo. His parents chose a dainty and innocent trifle, a basket with ten different fruit jellies and ten little jars. At the time of his birth, they had already been married for a long time. A score of years had elapsed and now they were quite old. Her drab gray hair was pinned up carelessly. She wore a cheap black dress. Unlike other women of her age, such as Miss Sol, their next-door neighbor, whose face was all pink and mauve with paint, and whose hat was a cluster of brookside flowers, she presented a naked white countenance to the fault-finding light of spring. Her husband, who in the old country had been a fairly successful businessman, was now in New York, wholly dependent on his brother Isaac, a real American of almost forty years' standing. They seldom saw Isaac and nicknamed him the Prince. That Friday, their son's birthday, everything went wrong. The subway train lost its life current between two stations and for a quarter of an hour they could hear nothing but the doubtful beating of their hearts and rustling of newspapers. The bus they had taken was late and kept them waiting a long time on the street corner, and when it did come, it was crammed with garrulous high school children. It began to rain, and they walked up the brown path leading to the sanitarium. They waited again and instead of their boy shuffling into the room as he usually did, his poor face sullen, confused, ill-shaven, and blotched with acne. A nurse they knew and did not care for appeared at last and brightly explained that he had again attempted to take his life. He was all right, she said, but a visit from his parents might disturb him. The place was so miserably understaffed and things got mislaid or mixed up so easily that they decided not to leave their present in the office but bring it to him the next time they came. Outside the building, she waited for her husband to open his umbrella and then took his arm. He kept clearing his throat as he always did when he was upset. They reached the bus stop shelter on the other side of the street and he closed his umbrella. A few feet away, under a swaying and dipping tree, a tiny underfledged bird was helplessly twitching in a puddle. During the long ride to the subway station, she and her husband did not exchange a word, and every time she glanced at his old hands, clasped and twitching upon the handle of his umbrella and saw their swollen veins and brown spotted skin she felt the mounting pressure of tears as she looked around trying to hook her mind onto something it gave her a kind of soft shock a mixture of compassion and wonder to notice that one of the passengers a girl with dark hair and grubby red toenails was weeping on the shoulder of an older woman she resembled rebecca borsovna whose daughter had married one of the Slovacheks in Minsk years ago. Last time the boy had tried to do it, his method had been, in the doctor's words, a masterpiece of inventiveness. He would have succeeded if not an envious fellow patient thought he was learning to fly and stopped him just in time. What he really wanted to do was tear a hole in the world and escape. The system of his delusions had been the subject of an elaborate paper in a scientific monthly, which the doctors at the sanitarium had given to them to read. But long before that, she and her husband had puzzled it out for themselves. Referential mania, the article had called it. In these cases, the patient imagines that everything happening around him is a veiled reference to his personality and existence. He excludes real people from the conspiracy, because he considers himself to be so much more intelligent than other men. Phenomenal nature shadows him wherever he goes. Clouds in the starring sky transmit to each other by means of slow signs, incredibly detailed information regarding him. His inmost thoughts are discussed at nightfall in manual alphabet by darkly gesticulating trees. Pebbles or stains or sunflecks form patterns representing, in some awful way, messages that he must intercept. Everything is a cipher, and of everything he is the theme. All around him there are spies. Some of them are detached observers, like glass surfaces and still pools. Others, such as coats and stone windows, are prejudiced witnesses, lurchers at heart.
Others again, running water, storms, are hysterical to the point of insanity, have a distorted opinion of him, and grotesquely misinterpret his actions. He must be always on guard and devote every minute and module of life to the coding of the undulation of things. The very air he excels, indexed, and filed away. If only the interest he provokes were limited to his immediate surroundings, but alas, it is not. With distance and torrents of wild scandal increase in volume and volubility, the silhouettes of his blood corpuscles, magnified a million times, flit over vast plains and still far away. Great mountains of unbearable solidity and height sum up in terms of granite and groaning firs, the ultimate truth of his being. When they emerged from the thunder and foul air of the subway, the last dregs of the day were mixed with the streetlights. She wanted to buy some fish for supper, so she handed him the basket of jelly jars, telling him to go home. Accordingly, he returned to the tenement house, walking up to the third landing, and remembered he had given her the keys earlier in the day. In silence, he sat down on the step, and in silence rose when, some ten minutes later, she came trudging heavily up the stairs, smiling wanly and shaking her head in deprecation of her silliness. They entered their two-room flat, and he at once went to the mirror straining the corners of his mouth by means of his thumbs with a horrible mask-like grimace he removed his new hopelessly uncomfortable dental plate he read his russian language newspaper while she laid the table still reading he ate pale victuals that needed no teeth she knew his mood and was also silent when he had gone to bed she remained in the living room with her pack of soiled playing cards and her old photograph albums across the narrow courtyard when the rain tinkled in the dark against some ash cans, windows were blandly alight, and in one of them a black trousered man with his hands clasped under his head and his elbows raised, could he see Lyons' spine on a tidy bed. She pulled the blind down and examined the photographs. As a baby, he looked more surprised than most babies. A photograph of a German maid they had in Leipzig and her fat-faced fiancé fell out of the fold of the album. She turned the page of the book. Minsk, The Revolution, Leipzig, Berlin, Leipzig again, a slanted house front, badly out of focus. Here was the boy when he was four years old, in a park, shyly with puckered forehead, looking away from an eager squirrel as he would have from any other stranger. Here was Aunt Rosa, a fussy, angular, wide-eyed old lady who had lived in a tremulous world of bad news, bankruptcies, train accidents, and cancerous growths until the Germans put her to death, together with all the people she had worried about. The boy, aged six, that was when he drew wonderful birds with human hands and feet, and suffered from insomnia like a grown-up man, his cousin now a famous chess player. The boy again, aged about eight, already hard to understand, afraid of the wallpaper in the passage, afraid of a certain picture in a book, which merely showed an idyllic landscape with rocks on a hillside and an old cartwheel hanging from the one branch of a leafless tree. Here he was at ten, the year they left Europe. She remembered the shame, the pity, the humiliating difficulties of the journey, and the ugly, vicious, backward children he was with at the special school where he had been placed after they arrived in America. And then came a time in his life, coinciding with a long covalence after pneumonia, when those little phobias of his, which his parents had stubbornly regarded as the eccentricities of a prodigiously gifted child, hardened, as it were, into a dense tangle of logical interacting illusions, making them totally inaccessible to normal minds. All this and much more she had accepted, for after all, living does mean accepting the loss of one joy after another, not even joys in her case mere possibilities of improvement. She thought of the recurrent waves of pain that for some reason or other she and her husband had had to endure, of the invisible giants haunting her boy in some imaginable fashion, of the incalculable amount of tenderness contained in the world, of the fate of his tenderness, which is either crushed or wasted or transformed into madness, of neglect, children humming to themselves in unswept corners, of beautiful weeds that cannot hide from the farmer. It was nearly midnight when from the living room she heard her husband moan, and presently he staggered in, wearing over his nightgown the old overcoat with the astrakhan collar that he much preferred to his nice blue bathrobe. I can't sleep, he cried. Why can't you sleep, she asked. 
You are so tired. I can't sleep because I am dying, he said and laid down on the couch. Is it your stomach? Do you want me to call Dr. Solov? No doctors, no doctors, he moaned. To the devil with doctors. We must get him out of there quick. Otherwise, we'll be responsible. Responsible. He hurled himself into a sitting position, both feet on the floor, thumping his forehead with his clenched fist. All right, she said quietly. We'll bring him home tomorrow morning. I would like some tea, said her husband, and went out to the bathroom. Bending with difficulty, she retrieved some playing cards and a photograph or two that had slipped to the floor. A knave of hearts, a nine of spades, the ace of spades, the maid Elsa and her bestial bow. He returned in high spirits, saying in a loud voice, I have figured it all out. We will give him the bedroom. Each of us will spend part of the night near him and the other part on the couch. We will have the doctor see him at least twice a week. It doesn't matter what the prince says. He won't have much say anyway, because it will come out cheaper. The telephone rang. It was an unusual hour for it to ring. He stood in the middle of the room, groping with his foot from one slipper that had come off, and childishly, toothlessly gaped at his wife. Since she knew more English than he, she always attended to the calls. Can I speak to Charlie? A girl's dull voice said to her now. What number do you want? No, you have the wrong number. She put the receiver down gently, and her hand went to her heart. It frightened me, she said. He smiled a quick smile and immediately resumed his exciting monologue. They would fetch him as soon as it was day. For his own protection, they would keep all the knives in a locked drawer. Even at his worst, he presented no danger to other people. The telephone rang a second time. The same toneless, anxious young voice asked for Charlie. You have the incorrect number. I will tell you what you are doing. You are turning the letter O instead of the zero. She hung up again. They sat down to their unexpected festive midnight tea. He sipped noisily. His face was flush. Even now and then he raised his glass with a circular motion so as to make the sugar dissolve more thoroughly. The vein on the side of his bald head stood out conspicuously, and silverly bristles showed on his chin. The birthday present stood on the table. While she poured him another glass of tea, he put on his spectacles and re-examined with pleasure the luminous yellow, green, and red little jars. His clumsy, moist lips spelled out the eloquent labels, apricot grape, beech plum, quince. He had gotten to crabapple when the telephone rang again. Symbols and Signs by Vladimir Novikov Narrated by John Wilkins